I'm Diana and I'm a paleoecologist here at Flinders University. So I'm in the last couple of months of my PhD and I want to show you a little bit about what I've been working on. So as a paleoecologist, what I'm interested in is entire ecosystems and how those different parts of those ecosystems interacted with each other in the past. And what I'm particularly interested in looking at is how Australia's vertebrate fauna responded to environmental changes in the past. And so to do this, I'm working at a cave site in New South Wales, the Wellington Caves. It's where the first fossils were found of Australian marsupials back in 1831. So it's significant historically, as well as having really good paleontology. And we get a whole range of species there from big animals like palacestes, right down to small, small rodents. The smaller fauna is usually more informative than the larger fauna for paleoecology because you can often find a lot of them in a fossil deposit and so we can actually track them through time and see how the abundance of these different small animals change through time and we can relate that back to their known habitat preferences or their known environmental conditions and we can use that to look at how conditions may have changed through time and also how these animals responded to those changes. So hi, my name's Phoebe and I'm a PhD student here in the paleontology labs at Flinders University. And I'm working on a group of birds called the Dromonithids. So this is a great group because they are the largest birds that were ever in Australia. And this one in particular is one of the largest birds to ever have existed in the world. So as you can see, this is one of the leg bones. So it's a tarsi, it's a tibia tarsus, and it's considerably large, especially when you place it against your average chicken bone, which is much, much smaller. Now, one of the birds that I'm working on in this group, Genionus newtoni, is the youngest bird or the most recently existing bird to um, have gone extinct from this family. So it's much younger than the rest of them. This one's about 6 million years old compared to Genionus newtoni, who's represented by this fossil here, who is about 45,000 years old. Now this bird itself is a Genionus newtoni that was uncovered in the Lake Calabona fossil deposit. So it was stuck in the mud a really long time ago, couldn't move, died there, and eventually it was found by the paleontology lab people here at Flinders and uncovered and brought to the lab to be studied. So what we can do with this specimen here, as you can see, there's some damage and there's a lot of dirt that's in some of these regions. So what we do to get a really good look at this fossil is we CT scan it and we put it into a program such as this one, which allows us to move through this fossil and then we can have a look at each individual element. So we're moving through really tiny slices or images of the fossil. And by going through that, we can pick out what's bone and what's not, and eventually develop a 3D image of what the bones look like. By doing this, we can segment out the individual bones and then we can make direct comparisons with other species based on these individual bones. So for example, here, I could pick out the pubis bone, which is this pink one along the bottom, and I could compare that to the bone in the chicken, which is obviously really different to what we have here, but it is the dromonithids, or well, one of the dromonithids closest relatives. So it's good that we're able to directly compare it, where it's really good solid material um, so that we can understand what's kind of changing between these closely related taxa. Hi everyone, my name is Jacob and I'm a PhD student here at Flinders University in the Paleontology Group. And I'm looking at birds, specifically rails, which are a wetland sort of group. They uh, hang around ponds and streams and you may have seen some around your home. So we have swamp hens, uh, coots, those types of birds. Um, so what am I actually doing? Well it's all good, well and good getting bones out of the ground, like for example I've got this foot bone of a bird here that's around 25 million years old. 
from Lake Pimper in South Australia. It's about a nine hour drive from Adelaide. Um, but what do we actually do once we've got this out of the ground? How do we tell what it's related to? So I've got all these rail bones here. These are on loan from various museums all around the world. And we can use all these bones to figure out what this is related to. Now this is really good to an extent. However, at some point you come against a, a bit of an opposition. Rails are particularly good at colonizing islands and they evolve to lose flight. And coupled with that, you get a lot of reduction in wing related bones. So for example, I've got these two sternae of some rails. This one's a buff banded rail and this one's a Lord Howell Island rail. This one here, it can't fly and it's shown by the really small uh, keel on the sternum here. Whereas this one has a large attachment surface for the muscles um, so it can fly. Now these two are actually really closely related and we know that from molecular data. So that's actually really useful because if we were just relying on morphology only, we would say this one is really different from the other one, right? So it's using a combination of molecular and morphological factors. And of course we don't get molecular information for really old fossils like this 25 million year old one here, that we can actually place this one amongst its living counterparts. Hi, my name is Alice and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at Flinders University. Being a postdoc means that I've already finished my PhD and I'm now conducting my own independent research um, here at Flinders. I'm part of the group that like to look at early vertebrates. So this is fish and the first uh, animals that evolved from fish and walked onto land or the first tetrapods. So when we study early vertebrates, we study everything in a broad range of things like sharks um, through to bony fishes such as lungfish or trout and then as I mentioned up to the first tetrapods, the first amphibians who walked onto land. So we've got some examples of some of um, what some of the fossils we work on might look like. This is a very obviously a shark's tooth. Um, but then we've got some weird and wonderful things that existed only in the Devonian period, which was some 400 million years ago. And the dominant group of that day was called placoderms. And these were really often they were very large fish and they had bony plates covering a lot of their head and trunk, such as this uh, model of Dunkleosteus or such as this Bothrolepis. So very strange fish, and they went extinct at the end of the Devonian. Um, we do do field work here, and a lot of our material that we work on comes from a place called Gogo in the northern part of Western Australia. And Gogo fossils look a bit like this. So they're encased in a limestone nodule, and then inside you can see the white of the bone. This is a type of lobe fin fish called an anicodont. So we can do some traditional uh, preparation techniques where we might use some mechanical preparation or even acid to get a fossil out of the rock. But a lot of what we do now is actually using technology, scanning technology, to look inside the fossils. Uh, and from that you can see we get a, a stack of x-ray images of a fossil so we can look right inside. And then from that you might be able to model out parts of the fossil that you're most interested in. So for example, there's a skull roof and beneath it, there's part of the brain case there. And then from that, you can even go further and model the internal parts of the fossil, such as this lungfish brain. So we're a vibrant group here in the paleontology lab and in particular, the fish group, we've, we've been hosting some international collaborators and visitors, which is really exciting. We've had visitors recently from Canada and the UK and it really helps us to place Flinders as being a part of international recognition in paleontology. One of the other types of fossils that we work on here are trace fossils. So most of what you've seen already are skeletal fossils or the bones that are left behind. But trace fossils are marks that an animal leaves on its environment as it's moving through it. So they can be things like fossil footprints or burrows or even bite marks left on bones. And what we've got here are an array of the trace fossils that we also work on here at Flinders. Now when we're looking at fossil footprints, often they're entombed in rock and it's not possible to collect them. 
So then we need to use this flexible silicon to mold the trackways so that we can have a permanent record of them. So at the front here, we've actually got a hopping trace of a giant extinct kangaroo. So there are two foot impressions preserved here. Then we've got things like this one, which looks a little bit like a dog print. You can see the individual digital pads here. This is actually a thylacine print. This is a print from Jenny Ornis, which is a giant extinct flightless bird. And over here, we've got a print from Kangaroo Island. And we can see that there are small toes here. And that's the foot outline there. This is actually the hind foot of a Tasmanian devil. And that's important because it tells us that Tasmanian devils were around on Kangaroo Island when this rock was laid down. And in fact, thylacines and devils were known all over the mainland up until about three to 5,000 years ago. Now, one of the other exciting trace fossils that we work on are bite marks on bones. This is the top of one of the leg bones of Diprotodon, the biggest marsupial that ever lived. And there are very small marks all over this bone, which have been made by teeth dragging across the surface of it. And these marks actually belong to a giant lizard called Megalania. It was a goanna that was four to five meters long. So this preserves really important information about a predator-prey interaction between Diprotodon and Megalania. Similarly, on this two, particular bone, we can see two bite marks at the top. Now this is the toe bone of a kangaroo and we can see here the skull of a Tasmanian devil and it just so happens that these two canine teeth fit perfectly in those two sockets. So by matching up the shape of the tooth with the shapes of the pits on the bone, we can figure out which animal was feeding on the channel. So this helps us reconstruct past trophic guilds. And the third type of trace fossil that we work on are coprolites or fossilized turds. And these can be important because they can offer a window into what an animal was eating. In some rare cases, we can see that there are either bone fragments preserved, which tells us we're gonna be looking at a carnivore turd, and sometimes we see fragments of plant. And that gives us an idea about what these animals have been eating in the past. So for those of you who are interested in paleontology, another part of my job is to manage volunteers here in the lab. So we have regular volunteers that come in to help prepare fossils, to help us sort through our sediments to pick out the tiny little rat teeth, and to help with molding and casting and other just general lab activities. So for more information on that, hit the website or follow the links. Cheers.